Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. The guests looked anxiously at their watches. The marriage ceremony was scheduled for 11 a.m. It was already 10.45, but the bride still hadn't arrived. Her phone wasn't answering, and the groom, a handsome blonde man, paced irritably in front of the entrance, not knowing what to expect. Nora had been acting strangely lately. A couple of months before the wedding, she suddenly announced that she had to go abroad for some urgent and important business, but she promised that she would be back by the time of the wedding. They regularly called each other, everything was fine, and suddenly on the wedding day, her phone didn't even answer. Where is she? Why isn't she answering? Does she even remember she's getting married today? The groom's name was Narciso. He had high hopes for this marriage. Nora was a wealthy bride, and her fortune was a tidbit for his ambitious plans. He had been cunningly wooing this stubborn girl, telling her how much he loved her. And now, when the victory was almost in his pocket, the bride disappeared. Damn her. Narciso never loved Nora, never even tried, but it didn't matter. He needed this marriage, and he was willing to do a lot, almost anything. 10.50 a.m. Nora's phone was still unavailable, but the ceremony was about to begin. Suddenly, Narciso noticed a familiar face in the crowd. It couldn't be. He took a closer look. It was Adelina, his beloved girl, the one he was hiding from everyone, especially from his fiancée. Why did she come here? What was going on? Did Nora's absence have something to do with Adelina? Narciso grew cold. But he had spent too long pursuing his goal, and he wasn't going to stop now. Pushing through the crowd of guests, he moved towards Adelina. Angrily grabbing the girl's arm and pulling her aside, he whispered angrily, What are you doing here? Why did you come here? You and I agreed on everything. Nora shouldn't know you existed. Adelina grinned. Don't you understand, darling? She murmured. Narciso frowned. What am I supposed to understand? Can't you just tell me directly? Why all the secrets and spy games? The guy was angry and nervous and couldn't control his emotions. But Adelina was surprisingly calm. Oh, it's a long story. She smiled softly, but I'll tell it to you now. Nora had hated the saying, don't be born beautiful, but be born happy ever since she was a child. What idiot was the first to say that stupid phrase? Life in this world was much easier for beautiful people. If you weren't beautiful, your chances of happiness were nil. Nora herself had never been beautiful. She had large, floppy ears, and her peers nicknamed her Dumbo the Elephant because of it. Her nose was longer than Pinocchio's. She had colorless eyelashes and eyebrows, small gray eyes, and crooked teeth. All in all, she looked like some kind of ridiculous garden scarecrow. The worst part was that Nora's mom was very beautiful, the kind of woman that men couldn't take their eyes off of and would do anything just to be with her. A dozen young men fought for her heart, but she chose Nora's dad a ridiculous, funny guy with a huge nose and fluffy ears. Nora looked just like him. Isn't that a mockery of fate? Why wasn't she born like her mom? Why were her father's genes stronger? Daddy himself didn't suffer much from the way he looked. Appearance is not important for a man, he used to say. Yeah, but then why was Nora so unlucky? She's a girl. Her dad also had charisma. People were sincerely drawn to him and adored him for his easy good-natured personality and a great sense of humor. In addition, he played guitar and had a talent for writing poetry. That's how he won the beauty's heart. But Nora didn't get even his charisma. She was very unattractive. One day she overheard her grandmother say to her mother in the kitchen, Nora is very ugly. It will not be easy for her to find a husband. What are you talking about? Her mom got angry. How can you say that about your granddaughter? I'm just telling the truth. We can only hope that her appearance will change over the years, Grandma sighed, but without much hope. After that, Nora cried all night long in her bed, covering her head with a blanket to muffle her sobs. 
Even though she was only four years old, she was already convinced that her grandmother's words were true. In kindergarten, the kids didn't want to be friends with her. The girls would gather in groups, whisper, and defiantly stop talking when Nora timidly approached them. Can I play with you? She asked shyly. Sometimes she was lucky, and the girls agreed, but most of the time they wrinkled their noses in disapproval. We're playing princesses, Valeriana, a pretty blonde girl with a doll's face and clear blue eyes, explained to her. The princesses are all beautiful, and you are not suitable for that, because you are not beautiful. But if you want, you can be a servant. The little girls sometimes graciously let her into their company, too. You don't have to be pretty to play catch-up or hide-and-seek, but Nora wanted a real friend. One day, the teacher was reading a story aloud to the children. At the phrase, Grandma, why do you have such big ears, all the children giggled and started pointing their fingers at Nora's ears. The girl got angry and hit the main mocker, Sergio, on the forehead with a cube as hard as she could. The offender started crying and all the children screamed. The teacher gasped and told Nora to go to the back of the room and stand there for an hour. By evening, Sergio had a huge bump on his forehead, and the teacher complained to Nora's mother about her daughter's terrible behavior. The victim's furious mother was standing nearby. She's just some sort of a young criminal. She said indignantly, Don't you educate your child at all? How can she treat her friend so cruelly? Sergio is not my friend. Nora said angrily, showing no remorse for what she had done. He is constantly mocking me. He's a fool himself. I know that my ears are big. But he still pees his pants and can't count to ten. Excuse us, her embarrassed mother mumbled. I'll talk to her at home. Yeah, do me a favor, talk to her. Sergio's mother pressed her lips into a thin line and, turning away defiantly, began to dress her son. However, the attempt to talk sense into Nora failed. Girls should be calm and shy. They should never fight, the mother began, but Nora only rounded her eyes in surprise. Why? If I'm being insulted and mocked, I won't tolerate it. She's right, Dad intervened. No one has the right to offend another person. You should know how to stand up for yourself. It seems like you are raising a boy, not a girl, Grandma sighed disapprovingly. Well, if Nora didn't turn out to be a princess anyway, Mom also sighed, let her be a little rebel. But Nora really wanted to be a princess. She also dreamed of playing Jasmine, Snow White, or Cinderella at kindergarten events. But she was always given the role of Stavella de Ville, Ursula, or Maleficent. Her mother once asked the teacher why her daughter was always playing some evil characters. Well, I apologize, she replied, but your daughter doesn't look like a princess at all. Look at her, you must understand it. I understand only one thing, her mother said coldly. It's ridiculous to judge a person's acting talent by the way they look. This is not a beauty contest, but a children's show. Of course, I can give Nora the role of a princess, the teacher said condescendingly, but everyone will laugh, both children and parents. Think about it. Her mother didn't want to argue and left. At the age of five, Nora learned to read, and on top of all her troubles, her eyesight deteriorated. She had to wear glasses, which gave her peers another reason to mock her. Four eyes. Elephant has four eyes. The kids mocked her. Nora bravely resisted the mockery, making up something clever and sharp. And those who have only two eyes look like black flies. And, of course, the offenders complained, and Nora got punished again as a rude, insolent child. It's okay, Dad comforted her. When you go to school, things will get easier. But it didn't get any easier. At school mockery, insults, and offensive nicknames became even worse. On the first day of school, Nora came in a beautiful outfit with a nice hairstyle. The first graders were entering the school, looking back at their parents anxiously. Nora smiled at everyone, hoping to make friends with someone, but no one was eager to talk to her, much less be friends with her. Even in the classroom, when everyone began to sit down at their desks, no one wanted to sit next to Nora. 
Eventually, the teacher told Roberto Velasco to sit next to her if no one wanted to sit next to him either because he was the smallest boy among them. That's how she made her first and, as it turned out, her only real friend. It was easier to survive in the cruel school world together. Together they resisted mockery and proudly ignored hurtful nicknames. Nora was nicknamed Scarecrow and Roberto was nicknamed Bug and Midget because of his short height. It's okay, Nora encouraged her friend. You will grow up and become a big, tall guy. Or maybe I will never grow up. What if I remain a midget? The funny little Roberto asked in fear. You will grow up, Nora nodded firmly and then sighed dreamily. And I, when I grow up, I will have plastic surgery. Why? Roberto was sincerely surprised. To be beautiful, Nora explained condescendingly. I think it's clear why. But you are already beautiful. Roberto said. You say that only because we are friends, the girl said sadly. But I know that's not true. It is impossible to live with such ears, such teeth, and such a nose. Roberto looked at her carefully and shrugged his shoulders. Normal ears, normal nose. Everyone has different ears and noses, it's normal. Come on. Nora was even a little offended. You don't understand anything about female beauty. And then suddenly life took an unexpected turn. During music lessons, the girl suddenly discovered a talent for singing. She had a wonderful, sweet voice. Nora instantly became the music teacher's favorite student, and she began to give her the main parts in the chorus and shows, asked her to sing at school concerts, and to organize school parties. Listen, the parents of other students began to ask, why do you always give this weird girl main roles? It would be much more pleasant to look at more beautiful faces. Your pretty faces have disgusting voices and no talent at all, the teacher said harshly one day. And this girl is a diamond. She is very talented. With the help of her teacher, Nora began to participate in city competitions and win prizes. You have a very, very talented girl. The music teacher said to her parents, If you help her to develop her talent, she will have a great future. So they decided that Nora should go to a music school to study music and singing. I don't think she'll be a singer in the future, her mother shrugged, but if she's good at it and enjoys it, why not? As the years went by, Nora grew up. She got more and more diplomas and awards in singing, but her appearance didn't change. Or rather, it seemed to her that she was becoming even more ugly and unattractive. In addition to everything else, she got metal braces to fix her teeth. And she was already 16 years old. She already wanted to communicate with boys, to be attractive, to catch their glances, but so far all the admiration and compliments went to her classmates. As for Nora, the boys looked at her with indifferent eyes, not even considering her as a girl. Only the faithful Roberto was always there for her. He wasn't as small as he was before. After the eighth grade, he suddenly transformed into a tall, handsome guy. After this metamorphosis, all the girls who had not paid any attention to Roberto before immediately became interested in him. Now they were constantly flirting with him, smiling, slipping love notes into his backpack, inviting him to walk together after school. Roberto only smiled as he told Nora about it. Of course, he wasn't going to date any of them. But why? She wondered one day. If you really like one of them, you can go on a date. I won't be offended, I promise. We're friends. I wish you happiness. Roberto looked away and mumbled reluctantly. I don't like any of them. None of them at all? She clarified doubtfully. He shook his head negatively. No one at all. You're weird, Nora said, but didn't focus on the subject. Nora secretly liked Alejandro Blanco, who didn't notice her at all. He was handsome and charismatic, so almost all the girls liked him, he could choose any of them. Nora had high hopes for the school New Year's Eve party. She would sing the Snowflake song at the party. She was especially good at singing this song. Her voice was sweet and sonorous. What if Alejandro would like the way she sings and finally notice her? 
What if he invites her to dance? What if he offers to walk her home after the party? These sweet hopes and dreams warmed her soul. For the first time in her life, Nora really cared about how she looked. She'd asked her parents to buy her new shoes and a dress, an absolutely beautiful dress, worthy of a real princess. Her mother also gave her a silver necklace. And finally, the long-awaited day had come. The girl spent half a day in front of the mirror. First, Nora decided to make a low messy bun, but then decided to leave her hair loose. At least her hair would hide her floppy ears. And those stupid glasses. Nora sighed in frustration. She tried wearing lenses, but she didn't feel comfortable in them. She took off her glasses and blinked confusedly. The world around her immediately became blurred, as if through rain-drenched glass. No, she wouldn't be able to walk without her glasses. Nora reluctantly put them back on. First, the students were waiting for the concert program, and then the disco. Many of the children were bored during the concert, waiting for dancing, but it was impossible to leave. The teachers and the principal were watching them. Nora was standing backstage, trying to calm down. She'd already had so many performances in her life. At school, at the city administration, in small palaces and huge concert halls, but she had never been as nervous as she is today. For the first time in her life, she was going to sing not for herself or for an abstract audience, but for a special person, and that person was Alejandro Blanco. Finally, after a breathtaking dance by the cheerleaders, it was Nora's turn to sing. The hostess announced from the stage, and now Nora Gomez will perform a beautiful song from the movie The Night Before Christmas. Nora heard the murmurs of the other members of the school concert near her. What the hell is The Night Before Christmas? Have you watched it? I have no idea. It's probably just some old movie. Nora always picks the oldest and most boring songs. Nora tried to ignore it, or rather, pretended she hadn't heard the hurtful whisper at all. She didn't care what anyone said or thought about her. She sings for Alejandro and only for him. This time, Nora tried to sing as perfectly as never before. She sang not only with her voice, but also with her heart, soul, feelings, and emotions. And now she dreamed of only one thing, that Alejandro would notice her, that he would hear her voice and immediately fall in love with her. She was singing and felt that she was doing great. Her voice was flowing like a crystal river, ringing like a silver bell, and the audience felt it. All their eyes were fixed on the stage. Surprisingly, when Nora sang, she didn't feel like an ugly duckling anymore. The ugly duckling was gone. Instead, there was a beautiful white swan on stage. There were no floppy ears, no long nose, no glasses, no braces. There was only a talented singer and her beautiful voice. When Nora finished singing and put the microphone back on the stand, the hall literally exploded with applause. They stunned her and Nora smiled gratefully pressing her hands to her heart. There was a pounding in her temples. I wonder if Alejandro liked it. After the concert, the long-awaited disco finally began. Nora was standing against the wall nervously, trying to find Alejandro in the crowd. The girl didn't see him anywhere, but she didn't give up hope. At that time, a slow song started playing. Almost all the teenagers left the dance floor. Many boys and girls stood against the wall shyly, but some of them were still dancing. There were romantic couples dancing slowly on the dance floor. Nora looked around confusedly. The hope in her heart was fading. At that moment, she saw the faithful Roberto making his way through the crowd toward her. Hi, Nora, he said. Shall we dance? Nora looked at him in surprise. Roberto had never suggested this kind of interaction before. It was strange and a little funny to imagine herself dancing with an old friend. Nora shook her head and sighed. I'm sorry, Roberto, but I'm not in the mood. At that very moment, she saw Alejandro's face among the teenagers. He wasn't dancing but walking confidently across the dance floor between the dancing couples, obviously looking for someone. Nora tensed and froze, afraid to even breathe. What if? No, it couldn't be. But what if he was really looking for her? 
Alejandro was coming closer and closer. Nora felt like her heart was going to jump out of her chest. When he was literally a few meters away, he finally looked at Nora. She blushed and tried her best not to look away. Instead, with her chin up, Nora stared boldly into his eyes. There could be no more doubts Alejandro was walking toward her. Oh my God, is he really going to ask me to the dance? She thought in a panic. Something that two minutes ago had seemed the most desirable thing in the world to her now frightened her to death. She'd never even danced before, moreover, with a boy. What if she stumbled and stepped on his feet? Hi, Alejandro said, approaching her. Are you Nora? Yes, she nodded, trying not to smile broadly. Nora Gomez. Right, Gomez, he said. Listen, you're... You were pretty cool singing that song. A fountain of sparkling happiness exploded in Nora's chest. Thank you, she nodded proudly again, trying not to shout from the excitement that swept over her. I can't believe it. He's really going to ask me to dance, her temples pounded. I really liked it, he added, looking at her curiously. And the song was so catchy. Nora nodded again like a Chinese dummy. Yeah, it's cool. For some reason, he hesitated to ask her to dance. Was he shy or afraid she would refuse? Or maybe it was Roberto, who was standing right next to Nora. For the first time ever, Nora was mad at her best friend. Why is he standing here? He looks like a bodyguard scaring all the guys away. At that moment, Alejandro's friend approached them. Nora had forgotten his name. Alejandro, hi, he clapped him on the shoulder. I thought you were on the dance floor. Why aren't you dancing? Nora froze. Now he would ask her to dance, for sure. But instead, the worst happened. Alejandro looked at Nora once again, turned away indifferently, and looked at his classmate. I don't feel like dancing, he said lazily. Besides, do you see any girls here you'd want to dance with? There's not a single normal girl left. All of them are so ugly. Without paying any attention to Nora, Alejandro and his friend walked away without even saying goodbye. The blood rushed to Nora's cheeks instantly. She had never felt so dishonored in her life. What did he say? There's not a single normal girl left? All of them are ugly? So, he literally said that Nora was ugly. She's so ugly that it's disgusting even to dance with her. Nora felt a lump in her throat. She was afraid to cry in front of everyone. But actually, in front of who? No one cared, except Roberto, who was still standing there, looking at her with a sympathetic gaze, as if he understood everything. That sympathy suddenly made Nora angry. Why don't we dance, Nora? Roberto suggested hesitantly. Why? She asked nervously, trying to hold back her tears. Out of mercy? Don't feel sorry for me. Don't you dare. Roberto widened his eyes in surprise. Out of mercy? What are you even talking about? I really want to dance with you. Why? Nora cried out, almost in despair. Why do you want to dance with me? Can't you see that there aren't any normal girls left? Do you want to dance with an ugly, pathetic, useless freak? Roberto's face got serious. I never thought you were ugly. Nora sobbed. You don't have to comfort me. I'm not a silly little girl anymore. I understand everything perfectly. Boys don't like girls like me. Moreover, usually, everyone just makes fun of people like me. Only if the people around you are idiots, Roberto said sharply. You. You just don't understand how wonderful you are. You're a real beauty. At this point, Nora couldn't stand it anymore and cried. Beauty? Stop mocking me. I didn't realize you were so cruel. Roberto was completely confused and, taking an uncertain step towards her, awkwardly embraced her and pressed her head against his chest. Nora, have I ever mocked you? I always tell you the truth. I really think you're. He didn't have time to finish. They were surrounded by their classmates, curious about what was going on. 
Whoa, someone said. What's going on here? What kind of weird love scene is this? Has Roberto suddenly developed tender feelings for Nora? What an unexpected turn of events. Look at them, they're hugging in front of everyone, and they're not even embarrassed, another voice echoed from the crowd. Maybe we should sing a song about the bride and groom? Roberto, I didn't know you had such bad taste, the most popular girl in the school Olivia said arrogantly. Couldn't you have picked someone more decent? Because Nora. She couldn't tolerate the humiliation any longer. Nora broke free from Roberto's embrace, pushed him away, and ran out of the hall. Since then, she has stopped going to school discos. After that incident, she and Roberto distanced themselves from each other. They didn't quarrel, but they still felt a strange confusion and embarrassment when they were near each other. They no longer felt as comfortable together as they used to. The only relief in Nora's life was still singing. She immersed herself in singing, competitions, concerts, and performances. After high school, she planned to go to university to continue her musical education. Her mother and grandmother only sighed. Singing is a good thing, Nora, they told her, but only as a hobby. But how are you going to make money in the future? By singing in subways and underpasses? Or do you want to sing in some choir where your voice won't even be distinguishable from all the others? So you don't even believe I'll have a successful solo singing career? You don't believe I'll succeed? Nora clarified sarcastically. Thank you for believing in me. Mom and Grandma looked at each other helplessly. We believe in you, of course we do, Grandma said, but don't get us wrong. I'm going to be blunt, to be a solo singer, you need a more expressive appearance. Nora laughed nervously. Thank you for your honesty, Grandma. You could have said straight out that I was born ugly. Is that what you meant to say? Dad intervened firmly in the discussion. Enough. He said angrily. Stop cutting the girl's wings. Singing is her joy, her happiness, the meaning of her life. It would be cruel to take even that away from Nora, forcing her to go and study to be some boring economist. It's her life, her future, it's up to her. Thank you, Daddy, Nora whispered gratefully. Her future was never discussed again in the family. Her family accepted her choice as a matter of fact. Time flew by unnoticed. The prom was over, and yesterday's schoolchildren were already standing on the threshold of a new, exciting, adult life. Roberto tried to talk to Nora several times during the prom, but she avoided the conversation. She didn't want anything, neither memories of her shame nor compassion. I will forget my high school years like a bad dream, Nora thought. The only person I will really miss is Marta Gonzalez, the music teacher who helped me find my path to a musical life. Marta Gonzalez was very proud of her students' achievements. Although there were no more music lessons in high school, she and Nora maintained a friendly relationship and the girl repeatedly came to her classroom to share the latest news and just to chat. You have a great musical future ahead of you, my girl, the teacher said confidently. I believe in you. As it turned out, she was right. Studying at the university was difficult, but very interesting. Nora immersed herself in her new life, her new world. She tried not to think about the past, neither about the mockery in kindergarten and school, nor about Alejandro Blanco, nor even about Roberto. She didn't know why she was avoiding her old friend, because he hadn't done anything wrong, but probably he reminded her of something she wanted to forget. Roberto tried to call and visit her in the first months after school, but Nora was cold and aloof. Eventually, the guy realized that she didn't want to continue their friendship and Roberto disappeared. Sometimes Nora missed their carefree time together. She still remembered how they went to the movies and the amusement park, how they bought ice cream for two, how they sat on the side of the fountain with their bare feet in the cool water. But Nora pushed those memories away. She didn't want any feelings or emotions anymore. No friendship, no love, she was no longer interested in anything. Only music, only career. Of course, not everyone at the university was like her. 
Girls and boys were falling in love, going on dates, skipping classes, breaking up, fighting, crying, and falling in love again. Life buzzed around Nora, but she didn't seem to notice anything. She didn't care about any of this nonsense. At least, now no one mocked her like at high school. After all, talent is a great thing. It protects a person in a certain way. Soon, everyone at the university was talking about Nora. A girl with a voice like a silver bell, teachers said about her, and students only enviously and admiringly sighed. Would you like to try yourself in some TV show? Her fellow student Veronica asked Nora one day. You'd be famous right away, I'm sure. Nora laughed unhappily. Can you imagine the shock of the TV hosts when they turn to me and see my face? No, thank you. Veronica looked at her meticulously. I think you underestimate yourself, Nora. Change your stupid old-fashioned glasses for contact lenses, get a fancy haircut, and dye your hair. Besides, you'll get your braces off soon, you said so yourself. You'll be completely unrecognizable. Yeah, Nora nodded grinningly. But you can always recognize me by my big ears and nose. Don't say that, Veronica replied. If you want, you can come to my place sometime. I'll do makeup for you. Just to see how it looks. What if you like it? No, Nora shook her head stubbornly. I don't want to. Thank you. Veronica glared at her judgmentally. It seems like you're just afraid to awaken your femininity, afraid to be attractive. I'm afraid, Nora admitted frankly after a pause. I'm afraid that no one will need that awakened femininity. It hurts too much, you know? To know that nobody needs you, nobody cares about you. I don't want that anymore. Not anymore. It's not for me. Veronica only sighed frustratedly. I just wanted to help, but whatever. The student years have come to an end. Before getting their diplomas, the graduates of the university organized an unforgettable music concert. Some of them were singing, some of them were playing musical instruments. Naturally, Nora was the biggest star of the event. Everyone applauded her loudly and gave her lots of flowers. Teachers called her the pride of the whole university. But the most incredible thing happened a little later. When Nora, holding many huge bouquets of flowers, was already making her way to the exit, an elderly gentleman blocked her way. He looked like a foreigner. A man with dark curly hair and back eyes looking very stylish in spite of his age. He was about 60. Good evening, signorina. He said, kissing her hand fervently. Nora almost dropped all her flowers out of embarrassment. Good evening, she said awkwardly, clutching the bouquets with one hand while the other was still in the stranger's hands. Let me introduce myself. My name is Andre De Luca. My job is to search the world for new talent. Your voice is incredible, bellissimo, marvelous, amazing. He was showering compliments in Spanish mixed with Italian words and Nora felt dizzy. Are you Italian? She asked incredulously. See, si. he nodded. See, si, of course, I am. Italiano, he added to make it more clear to her. But you speak Spanish very well. Because many of my clients are Spanish-speaking singers. Your clients? Nora asked incredulously. Oh, I see that Signorina is confused and tired of holding this huge bouquet of flowers. Let's have a cup of coffee somewhere nearby and I'll tell you about my work. But why? Nora asked, clutching the flowers tightly to her as if they were a protective shield. I have an offer for you that would be impossible to refuse. Impossible. He added persuasively, shaking his lush hair. And suddenly, Nora said yes. The offer Andre had made to her was really amazing. He told her that he was traveling the world looking for young, talented musicians and singers so that he could offer them a job in Italy. It was not just a job offer, it was Nora's dream. It turned out that many of Andre's clients were now working in the best opera houses in the world, La Scala, La Fenice, San Carlo. Nora felt dizzy from such prospects. Singing on the stage of La Scala? 
She couldn't imagine such a thing even in her wildest dreams, but she was still afraid to trust a man she met 20 minutes ago. What would I have to do for that? She asked cautiously. Just sign the contract, signorina, and I will take you to Italy for the audition. Of course, I'll cover all your living expenses, visa, and plane ticket. Don't worry about that. And then, if the theater management likes you, and I'm sure they will, they'll sign an official contract with you. But what's your benefit? Nora asked. I'll get a decent bonus from the theater for bringing them such a diamond, Andre smiled. Well, that was fair enough. He was the agent who introduced the future star to her potential employers. I need to think about it, to discuss it with my family, Nora finally said, though she wanted to shout, yes, yes, I agree. Give me your contract and I'll sign it right away. Of course, Signorina, think it over. In any case, you have nothing to lose. Nora said exactly the same thing at home that evening. I have nothing to lose in any case. Even if it doesn't work out, I'll travel to Italy at someone else's expense. What if he's some kind of crook? Mom shook her head. What if he wants to trick you or even turns out to be some kind of pervert or maniac? What's the point? Nora shrugged. He'd have to spend a lot of money on a visa and tickets. Why go through all that trouble, even if he is a maniac? She answered. He could have killed me right after the concert, right there. Her mother gasped. Oh, what are you even talking about? Don't say that ever again. In any case, you should read the contract carefully, Dad intervened, but in general, I think that this is incredible luck. You can't miss such a great chance. They say Italians are very romantic and passionate, Grandma said. Maybe our girl will find a fiancé there. Everything is possible. Nora rolled her eyes. Come on, Grandma, that's all you care about. I don't need any suitors now. I only think about work. She brilliantly passed the audition and was accepted into one of the best opera houses in the world. It was like a fairy tale, a dream that came true. At first, Nora could not believe that it was happening to her. She could suddenly stop in the middle of the street and laugh happily. She probably looked crazy from the outside, but Italians were quite expressive people. It was hard to surprise anyone here by showing sincere emotion. Despite the fact that at first Nora could hardly understand Italian and her colleagues could hardly speak English, she loved working in the theater. They communicated using the language of gestures. The most important thing is that when it came to music, they all understood each other with no words. Nora's extraordinary voice was greatly admired by her management, colleagues, and, of course, the audience. She remembered her debut on this famous opera stage for the rest of her life. She was singing the aria Carmen. The audience literally bathed her in love, flowers, and applause. Nora became a celebrity, a real star. She was invited for interviews for various magazines and TV channels. She learned to speak conversational Italian, fell in love with Italian cuisine, got used to the climate, and liked the local people for their easygoing and cheerful nature. Money streamed to her. She earned much more than she could spend. Nora rented a luxury apartment near the theater, bought a nice car, and traveled all over Italy and Europe. In general, her life was more like a fairy tale. But her personal life was still not going well. Although Nora had long ago promised herself that she would never fall in love, still sometimes sadness tormented her heart. What's wrong with me? She often thought, I'm not that ugly. I'm just not too standard. Why does everyone have dates, but no one pays attention to me, neither in Spain nor here in Italy? However, in Italy, young, handsome Italians showed her signs of attention and flirted with her. At first, due to her inexperience, Nora was sure it was sincere, but then it turned out that all of them were classic professional gold diggers, all they wanted was money. They openly voiced their terms and prices. Nora had to support and spoil them, take them to restaurants and vacations, buy expensive gifts and fashionable clothes, and they would provide her with a regular sexual life and accompany her to all the events, making other women envious. 
When Nora heard it for the first time, she was indignant. How dare they offer her such nonsense? But later it turned out that this is absolutely normal here. Everyone made a living the best they could. And her family was adding fuel to the fire. Working in the Italian opera, Nora couldn't go to her homeland very often, but she talked to her family regularly via video link. Her father and mother always tried to think before saying something, but her grandmother literally bombarded her with tactless questions, advice, and wishes. So, any news on your personal life? Have you found a boyfriend? No? Why? Aren't any Italians interested in you? You probably don't even let anyone get close to you. Oh, Nora. You'll grow old alone. What are you thinking about? You should be thinking about family and children. The clock is ticking. Career won't go anywhere, even when you are old, but very soon it will be too late to have a baby. One day, after listening to her grandmother's warnings for the umpteenth time, Nora couldn't stand it anymore and got mad. Even if I grow old all alone, so what? Do you really think that lonely people are not humans, or what? I'll get a cat if I feel lonely. I won't be lost. A human being can't live alone, her grandmother said admonishingly. Who will give you a glass of water in your old age? I'll hire a housekeeper, Nora said gloomily and disconnected the call. She understood that her grandmother was worried about her, but it seemed so intrusive and rude that after each such conversation, Nora was in a bad mood for the rest of the day. And then she met Narciso. Nora remembered that day for the rest of her life. After another opera, in which she performed the main vocal part, the girl went to her dressing room, took off her makeup, took a shower, and changed clothes. She had two days off ahead of her, and she planned to spend them on the seashore in Portofino. It was one of the most beautiful and picturesque places in Italy. She needed to go home, grab her travel bag, and head to the airport. She didn't realize how it happened. Suddenly, a man appeared on the road from nowhere. Nora hit the brake, but it was too late. She heard a thud on the hood, and then the noise of a body collapsing onto the road. Oh my gosh, Nora whispered. No, no, please no. This can't be. She had just hit a human with her car. It was impossible to believe. A crowd immediately began to gather around the car. Emotional Italians rolled their eyes, raised their hands to the sky, pressed their palms to their hearts, shook their heads, and shouted something, pointing their fingers at Nora. She was very afraid to get out of the car. She was afraid the crowd would tear her apart, but she had to pull herself together and get out. She opened the door, got out of the car, and, afraid to look in the direction of the body, raised her hand and said, Calm down, please. I'm going to call the police and an ambulance. What was her surprise when the body moved and uttered in a mix of broken Italian and Spanish? Don't call the police. I'm fine, I'm okay. Nora gasped and leaned over the injured man, unable to hold back a sigh of relief. Alive. At least he's alive. She's not a killer. I'll take you to the doctor, she said confusedly. Forgive me, please forgive me. I don't know how it could have happened. I just didn't see you. God, what a blessing that you are alive. Don't worry, I'll cover all medical expenses. Wow, the victim marveled, looking up at her with surprised eyes. Do you speak Spanish? Nora looked into his eyes and realized she was lost. In half an hour, they were sitting at a table in her favorite restaurant, talking as if they had known each other for a hundred years. The man's name was Narciso. He had come to Italy as a tourist. And he was very handsome. It seemed like a god from Roman mythology had come to life blonde curls, sensual lips, light blue eyes. At one point Nora realized she wasn't listening to what he was saying. She just watched the way his lips moved. It was a mesmerizing sight. She was frankly staring at him. Eventually, Narciso stopped talking, probably noticing that her thoughts were wandering far away from the topic of conversation. I'm sorry, I must be boring you with my stories. It's not interesting to you? Very interesting. She nodded. 
She had completely forgotten about the time, about being late for the airport. But she didn't need a weekend in Portofino anymore, as long as her new friend continued to sit next to her and talk to her. But all good things come to an end sooner or later. Narciso glanced at his watch and realized, Damn, I've taken up so much of your time. I'm sorry. It's all right, Nora said with a sigh, realizing that the fairy tale was coming to an end and the magical evening was almost over. The waiter brought the bill, and Narciso insisted that he would pay for both of them. After the pushy brazen gold diggers who believed that Nora should pay for all their pleasures, it seemed especially nice. However, Narciso didn't know she was rich. He didn't recognize her at all. He was not fond of opera and didn't even know that she was a famous singer. They walked out of the restaurant together and stopped hesitantly looking at each other. Perhaps now they should say goodbye and go their separate ways. Nora was sad to think about it, but Narciso suddenly asked, Do you often visit your homeland? Not very often. Why? She replied, It's just that I have a flight home tomorrow night, but I would like to see you again. Her heart jumped up with joy. See me again? Nora repeated. Narciso nodded. Yes, I had such a good time with you. I would like to talk about so many things. Leave me your phone number, Nora asked, pulling herself together. When I'm in Spain, I'll call you. That's how their romance began. A romance that was completely unbelievable. If someone had told Nora a month ago that an unbelievably handsome man would fall in love with her, she would not have believed it, but nevertheless, that's exactly what happened. Narciso fell in love with her without knowing that she was rich and famous. He was interested in Nora herself, not her money and fame. After a month of tender and romantic courtship, he proposed to her. Nora didn't hesitate for a second. When her contract with the Italian theater came to an end, she refused to renew it. Now she was going to build her life in her homeland with her beloved husband. She wouldn't be out of work anyway. Any opera house would gladly hire such a star. Nora introduced her fiancé to her parents and grandmother. Mom and dad treated the future son-in-law a little wary. This sudden outburst of love seemed strange to them. It looked a little suspicious. Don't get me wrong, darling, her mom said to her later, embarrassed. Narciso is such a charismatic, handsome guy. But I'm ugly, right? Nora interrupted her sharply. That's what you were going to tell me. Her mom was embarrassed. No, of course not. It just seems a little weird anyway. Mom, thank you again for believing in me. Nora said emotionally. You don't even believe that someone could fall in love with your daughter. Grandmother was pleased, though. Finally, her cherished dreams were coming true. Her granddaughter had found a handsome suitor. The wedding was already scheduled, and hopefully, she would have a chance to see her great-grandchildren. But two months before the wedding, Nora accidentally overheard Narciso talking on the phone. She was going to go shopping, but forgot her purse and returned home. Standing in the doorway, she heard Narciso's voice. He was talking to someone. His voice was rough and irritated, very different from his usual soft and affectionate tone. Yes, Narciso was saying, I need it urgently. The wedding is just around the corner. You know, I don't think I can stand living with such a wife for long. She froze and listened more carefully. Her heart was pounding like crazy. Of course, it should be instant death with no chance of rescue, and it should be impossible to detect the poison in the body. You said you had such a poison, so it would look like a heart attack or something. So the coroner can't determine the actual cause of death. Nora pressed her back against the wall and shuddered. What had Narciso just said? Poison, death, heart attack? Of course, I'll pay as much as needed, her fiancé continued. Money won't be a problem. When my wife dies, I'll be very rich. What the hell is going on? Nora refused to believe her own ears. Was he talking about her? But why? Why did you want to kill her? Yeah, Narciso continued. 
I'm sick of pretending to be the idiot who fell in love with her. Every time I force myself to kiss her, I look at her and think, oh my gosh, I wish you'd just die as soon as possible and then I'd get all your money. Nora felt disgusted. So all of Narciso's love is a lie? A brazen, cynical, despicable lie? Was it all for the sake of marrying her and then sending her to the other world and getting all her wealth? What a dirt. What a vile, pathetic man. How could she believe him? Mom and Dad were right. But she didn't listen. Stupid. She was so stupid to believe in his love. Tears flowed down her cheeks. Nora covered her mouth with her palm and ran out the door. She didn't know yet what she would do with the information she had discovered, but she knew for sure Narciso shouldn't find out that she was aware of his plan. He should think that she still doesn't know anything, believes him, and waiting for the wedding. Narciso hated rich people since childhood. They had everything, while he had nothing. He grew up in an orphanage, but always knew that he had a great future ahead of him. He wasn't going to waste his life working hard for some company. Narciso wanted more. He didn't know who his parents were, but he inherited a bright and spectacular appearance from them. Women always liked him, both his age and older. Narciso knew that he had to find a rich wife, and then, when she went to the other world, to get her wealth and finally live happily ever after. He was even willing to marry some elderly rich lady, but for some reason, millionaires were not in a hurry to offer him a legal marriage. Yes, many of them were flattered by the presence of a handsome young lover, but none of them made serious plans for him. He was treated like a temporary toy, and it made him angry. It wasn't difficult to seduce this inexperienced fool because she was naive and gullible. He had to pay for a ticket to Italy and then go to the theater where she worked, wait for her to come out, and jump under the wheels of her car. The plan worked perfectly. This stupid girl believed that she had hit him, got nervous, and offered to take him to the doctor. He immediately used all his charm, and an hour later, they were already having dinner together in the restaurant. Narciso immediately realized she had fallen in love from the first second. It was very easy to charm her. He diligently pretended to be in love with her, wooed her magnificently, said compliments, and gave her nice gifts. To make sure she didn't suspect anything, he spent his own money for now. Nora was finally convinced that he was an unselfish and sincere man who was not interested in her money but loved her for her heart and soul. She's incredibly stupid. Has she seen herself in the mirror? How could she believe someone would fall in love with her? Especially someone as handsome as Narciso. He tried to speed things up as much as he could. But he still felt that things were moving too slowly. Their marriage ceremony was supposed to take place in three months. He wanted simply to go to the registry office and register the marriage officially. Without guests and party, it would have been much quicker, but Nora refused. She wanted everything for real, a white dress with a veil, a limousine, champagne, guests. Damn Nora. A pharmacist he knew had promised to get him a reliable poison that was almost impossible to detect in a dead person's body. From the outside, it would look like a heart attack. Narciso was going to use the poison shortly after the wedding. He was already preparing to play the role of an inconsolable widower, weeping and telling in all interviews how he and Nora loved each other and that she had left this world too early. But then suddenly Nora changed dramatically, became gloomy and silent, and started avoiding meetings with him. To all his alarmed questions, she only answered that it was a natural nervousness before the wedding. And then suddenly she packed up and left for Italy. I have some work to do at the theater, she explained. I'll take care of it and come back. It's only for three months. Don't worry, Narciso, I'll be back before the wedding. Don't be too sad while I'm away. I'll be back soon. But he didn't even think of being sad. On the contrary, this time before the wedding was a relief for him. He no longer had to pretend to be madly in love. He could relax and enjoy his life. And two weeks ago, he'd met a gorgeous girl at a nightclub. She approached him and asked him to buy her a cocktail. Narciso looked at her and immediately fell in love with her thin waist, 
big breasts, lush hips, a waterfall of silky golden hair, plump scarlet lips, expressive almond-shaped eyes, small nose. She looked like a goddess. Hi, my name is Adelina, she introduced herself. It seemed to Narciso that she was not talking, but purring like a kitten, her voice was so mesmerizing. He fell in love like a schoolboy, even though he realized that Adelina only wanted money from him. She shamelessly asked for gifts, jewelry, expensive clothes, luxury handbags. She demanded to take her to expensive clubs and restaurants, and Narciso obeyed her whims, spending the last of his money, hoping to become rich soon. Why don't you marry me? She asked capriciously. I'll marry you. I'll definitely marry you. He promised. But not now, later. First, I'll handle some things. I know what you are talking about. Adelina said one day, resentfully. You're going to marry that ugly freak. It won't take long, Narciso promised. I have to do that. You'll understand everything later. Just be patient. The most important thing is that Nora never sees you. We can't let her find out about you. If you obey me, very soon you and I will be happy together. But where will Nora go? She asked incredulously. Don't think about it. I will take care of it. Just trust me. Finally, when the job was almost done, the wedding day had come. Nora had called a week before saying that she would come back on time, that everything was fine, but suddenly something went wrong. Narciso kept nervously calling his fiance. They should have been at the marriage registry hall a long time ago, but Nora was still not there. Suddenly, Narciso noticed Adelina's face in the crowd. No way. Why did she come here? He angrily grabbed the girl's arm, pulled her aside, and whispered angrily. What the hell are you doing here? I told you to stay away from Nora. What the hell are you doing? Adelina grinned. Don't you understand, darling? What am I supposed to understand? Can't you just tell me directly? Why all the secrets and spy games? Well, then, listen to an interesting story. The girl coughed and began loudly, attracting everyone's attention. Once upon a time, there was a handsome but poor guy named Narciso. He wanted to have a lot of money, but he was not willing to work, so he tried to get money in another, easier and more pleasant way, for example, through the beds of rich women. What are you talking about? He clenched his teeth and grabbed her arm. Shut up, silly girl. But Adelina calmly pulled her hand away. Darling, try to control your emotions, she murmured and continued. One day Narciso met Nora, a rich, naive, and ugly girl. She was easy prey. It was enough to fake a car accident, and the girl fell in love with the poor injured boy. Narciso turned cold. What is she talking about? How did she know about the fake accident? He hadn't told anyone about it. They began a passionate romance. So passionate that Narciso quickly proposed to Nora. He couldn't wait to get her money. However, Narciso was not going to live happily ever after with her. He found a pharmacist who was ready to sell him poison to send his wife to the other world soon after the wedding. The guests listened in shock. Narciso felt like the ground was slipping from under his feet. Shut up. He demanded. Right now. He looked around at everyone present with a confused look. She's making all this up because she's jealous. She's lying. I may be lying, Adelina smiled, but the records of your conversations with the pharmacist are not lying. Your phone has been bugged for a long time, and believe me, there's enough dirt there. Narciso's forehead was covered with cold sweat. Was the phone bugged? So, Nora figured it all out. What a bitch. But how would Adelina know that? You're bluffing, he said uncertainly, looking at the girl he'd recently thought he loved. Adeline, you're just angry that I'm marrying someone else. God save me from such a husband. Adelina laughed bitterly. I regret only one thing, I should have crushed you back then, in Italy, when you jumped under the wheels of my car. Narciso thought that he had misheard something. What? Under the wheels of your car? But, wait, 
What does that have to do with you? His voice treacherously shook. There was Nora, not you. Adelina shook her head, looking at him almost sympathetically. You never figured it out, dummy. It shows once again that you don't know how to love anyone but yourself. You didn't love poor Nora, but you didn't love Adelina either, since you couldn't realize that they were the same girl. Narciso felt like he was slowly going mad. It can't be. He said dumbfounded. It can, Adelina said in Nora's voice. A loving man would have long ago recognized me by a thousand different things, facial expressions, gestures. I hadn't even changed my voice much. I just spoke a tone lower and became completely unrecognizable to you. But your face. He almost shrieked. You're different. Where are your floppy ears, your nose, and your stupid glasses? And Nora's hair was a different color. You're an idiot, Adelina, a.k.a. Nora, sighed. I traveled abroad and had a few plastic surgeries. It wasn't cheap, but it was worth it to reveal your plan and to make myself look better. I'm tired of being just an ugly freak. I'm an opera diva after all, and I have a bright future ahead of me. The guests began to whisper, shocked by what they had heard. At that moment, the door to the wedding registry hall opened and the bride and groom were invited inside. Nora shook her head negatively. Thank you, but we're not getting married. The registry office employee looked at her in confusion. Are you sure? Think it over carefully. You have plenty of time. Nora shook her head again confidently. No, I won't change my mind. The wedding's canceled. And suddenly, Nora felt exhausted and sat down on the floor, covering her face with her hands and crying. Narciso was immediately arrested. The dirt on him and on the pharmacist was enough to arrest both of them. Strangely, Nora experienced no joy or at least a trivial sense of satisfaction. She felt bitterness and emptiness after everything that had happened. That day, when she had just learned the terrible truth and ran outside like crazy, she didn't want to live at all. What for? Her temples were pounding. What's it all for, if no one wants me? Even the person I love secretly dreams of my death. Why should I live if no one loves me? She even thought it would be better if she really died. She wanted to jump under the wheels of a car and end her miserable life, but something stopped her. She thought about her mom, dad, and her grandmother. Besides, she wasn't sure that she would instantly die under the wheels of a car. She could just end up disabled for life, and that's even worse. At least now she still has her favorite thing, music. And no one can take that away from her. And she doesn't need love. Nora was once again convinced of that. She had plastic surgeries in Italy. There she had a lot of useful connections, and her friends recommended the best clinics with the best doctors. She immediately informed her parents about her plan so that they would not cause unnecessary panic at the wedding. Her dad, having learned about Narciso's insidious plans, was furious. I'll kill him with my own hands. He shouted. How dare he plan to murder my daughter? If you kill him, you'll go to jail. Mom shook her head with a sigh. No, let's put the bastard in jail. As for Grandma, she was unexpectedly enthusiastic about the idea of plastic surgery. You'll be a real beauty, she told her granddaughter. And you can finally find a normal boyfriend. After those words, Nora's mom couldn't take it anymore. She became furious. Enough, she shouted. You've been saying since her childhood that it would be difficult for her to find a fiancé. You're always hinting at her unfortunate appearance. Stop it. Outer beauty is not more important than inner beauty, and getting married is not the most important thing in life. The grandmother was confused and embarrassed and only uttered that she wanted what was best for her granddaughter and that she only wished happiness for Nora. However, she never returned to the subject of marriage. In an Italian clinic, Nora had changed the shape of her eyes, her nose, and her ears. 
The rest was just the result of the work of stylists and beauty salons, a new hairstyle and hair color, lenses instead of glasses, good makeup, and finally, she turned into a beauty. It was impossible to take the eyes off her. Her body has always been attractive. She just used to wear ugly oversized clothes. At first, Nora planned to make Narciso fall in love with her so that he would feel the real pain, the same pain she felt. But the more she interacted with her fiancé under the mask of Adelina, the more she was convinced that this man didn't really love anyone but himself. She thought it would be difficult to pretend to be another girl in front of him. But she did it easily. Nora was even excited. She wanted to put this scoundrel in jail so badly. She just had to get enough evidence and dirt. Fortunately, Narciso was very talkative and said a lot of unnecessary things on the phone. By that time, his phone was already bugged, so the only thing left was to surprise him at the wedding and look at his shocked face. And so justice was served. The bastard was arrested, and Nora began to think about returning to the theater as soon as possible. Singing calmed her, giving her peace of mind, but her heart was still cloudy and sad. It seemed that Nora had lost her taste for life. But one warm summer evening she was walking in the park and suddenly heard someone calling her name. The girl turned around. A tall, handsome young man was approaching her. His face was very familiar, and then Nora realized. Roberto? She gasped. It was really him, her former classmate. He hadn't changed much, only grown older and stronger, but he was still that sweet, cute boy, the only friend she had in her school days. I'm so happy to see you. Nora said sincerely. I'm happy to see you too. He smiled broadly. Suddenly, Nora felt confused. Wait, how did you know it was me? Roberto looked at her in confusion. What do you mean? Well, we've all changed since high school, but not so much that I didn't recognize you. Nora shook her head. I haven't just changed. I've changed a lot. Don't you notice? Roberto shrugged. Well, you look better, more pretty, more radiant. Nora didn't know whether to cry or laugh. Better? Roberto, are you kidding me? But her school friend looked genuinely confused and didn't understand her displeasure. Well, yes, you look even better than you did then. I always liked you. What? She refused to believe her ears. Roberto sighed heavily, pulling himself together, and then said, I liked you at first sight. I always liked your bright nature, your sense of humor, your kindness, your sincere smile. I ran to school every morning with joy because I knew I would see you there. If you didn't come to school because you were sick or anything else, my whole day was ruined. You were a ray of sunshine in my life. Nora swallowed the lump in her throat. You never told me that. Roberto grinned unhappily. There were a lot of things I didn't tell you. I was too shy. Like what? Nora asked. Like the fact that around sixth grade, I realized that I had fallen in love with you, really fallen in love. You weren't just a friend to me anymore. But you didn't notice my affection. Nora shook her head dumbfounded. I didn't notice it at all. But, Roberto, how could you fall in love with me? I mean, I was so ugly. Nora, stop it. He got angry. You still don't realize how amazing you are. You were always talking nonsense about being ugly, about your nose and ears. But it's just bullshit. For me, there is no one in the world more beautiful than you. Because I see the unique, special inner light in you, and it makes you the most beautiful girl on earth. Do you really see nothing different in me? Nora whispered, pressing her palms to her blushed cheeks. He looked at her face. Well, you don't wear your glasses anymore. Nora shook her head. Silly. I've had several plastic surgeries. Nora laughed. Why? The guy was surprised. Well, to be beautiful, Nora was confused by the question. No one found my appearance attractive except you. Roberto sighed. No, Nora, you're silly. You were already beautiful. 
And those people who couldn't see your beauty, they were just blind, stupid strangers, and they didn't really care about you. Nora smiled. Do you care, then? I do, Roberto nodded seriously. I always did. There was an awkward pause. So, are you single, or? Nora asked cautiously. Roberto shook his head. I'm single. And in case you're curious, my feelings for you haven't changed since high school. Nora almost choked. Is that really possible? The guy sighed. Unfortunately, yes. I tried to forget you, but for all these years, I couldn't forget you. And you. What about you? Do you have a boyfriend? He asked cautiously. Nora shook her head. I'm completely single. Well, then, maybe, Roberto hesitated, shifting from foot to foot. Maybe we could go out? For dinner, or to the cinema, or theater. I'd love to, Nora nodded, smiling. And even though it was too early to make any predictions. No one knew how their relationship would turn out in the future, whether it would grow into something more than just a childhood friendship, or whether they would remain best friends. But there was one thing Nora knew for sure, he was the only person in the world who loved her and appreciated her for who she was. He loved her personality. The shape of her nose or the size of her ears didn't matter to him. He didn't even notice the difference after the plastic surgeries. To him, she was always the same Nora he had met years ago. And that means that even in the future, her gray hair, her wrinkles, or any other age-related changes won't matter to him. She will always remain the best girl for him, one and only. She could entrust her life, her loyal friendship, and, perhaps, her love to him. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.